for enjoying the, I mean enjoying the nice dreary rainy weather. I enjoy it and uh, it's actually good to have some more rain and hopefully it'll cool things down a little bit to uh, some nice Texas fall weather which is about 87 <laughs> degrees and uh, maybe it'll cool down to the 70s by Christmas time. <clears throat> In uh, the early phase of Christianity the Roman Empire struggled to understand this new religious movement. They struggled to understand who they were, why they were in existence. They struggled really to even comprehend them as something separate from Judaism. For quite a while they viewed them as a simple sect of Judaism and it wasn't until later that as they saw the Jews persecuting the Christians that they realized there was something more to this. And of course after the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70 and Christianity's growth and explosion within the Roman Empire they began to understand Christianity a little bit more. But within the early misunderstandings in the latter half of the first century, early half of the second century, there was a lot of misunderstanding to the practices of Christianity. And a lot of false accusations were thrown at Christians simply because people couldn't comprehend what they were doing or they were looking at it from a particular lens. In fact, one of the number one accusations that was brought against the early Christian church by the Roman Empire was that they were cannibals. The church was actually accused of cannibalism quite often. And the reason being was that there was a short period of time where all the Romans knew the Christians were doing was that they were eating and drinking the blood and the body of their master, of their teacher. And so from their standpoint, they thought that there was some type of cannibalistic activity that was going on. Later, as they investigated it, they began to understand it and comprehend it a little bit more. But what it shows me is that there is the, the Lord's Supper, what we often refer to as the Lord's Supper or communion or as others refer to it, the Eucharist, which comes uh, uh, from the word, the Latin word Eucharista, which means thanksgiving. Okay? When, when we're talking about this particular practice, we're talking about something that's very common to everyone, most of you in this building, right? Maybe you've done it since you were a child, or maybe it's something that you've become used to. But from outsiders looking in, the practice of partaking of the Lord's Supper, if you think about it, looking at it from fresh eyes is kind of an odd activity. It's kind of something that uh, if you're not used to doing it, it's a little bit different. Yes, they might, uh, yes, singing to your God, praying to your God, doing acts of service for your God. But why in the midst of this are you eating and drinking something? In particular, why are you eating unleavened bread and why are you drinking grape juice, right? Why are you doing these things? Well, interestingly enough, this early accusation of cannibalism within the church gives us insight into the early practices of the church that are testified in Scripture. Ask yourself this question. What is the center of Christian worship? What is the center of Christian worship? Well, I think in 1 Corinthians 11 and 20 and 21, we see an interesting implication. There, Paul is actually condemning the Corinthians for a malpractice of the Lord's Supper. But he says there, when you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you're partaking. Now, he's condemning them in that moment. He's rebuking them for the practices they're doing. But the implication of that, when he says, when you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper that you're partaking. What's the implication? that the reason they were coming together, the reason they were supposed to be coming together, was to partake of the Lord's Supper. And they weren't doing that. Now that's not to say that the Lord's Supper is more important or more elevated than other acts of worship. But I think that we need to view the Lord's Supper as the hub of Christian worship. It's at the center of Christian worship and every other activity that we do are the spokes that come off of that hub. And so we see that constantly testified in Scripture, the centrality of this, what we often refer to as a memorial. And we'll talk about that a little bit, uh, a little bit later. Early on within Christian doctrine, this practice was attested to throughout the Gospel accounts. One of the most 
famous accounts is found in Matthew chapter 26, where we'll spend a little bit of our time this evening in Matthew chapter 26, verses 26 through 29. And we see it that, that, it, that the partaking of the Lord's Supper was practiced after the ascension of Christ. For example, in Acts 20 and verse 7, we already saw 1 Corinthians 11, 20 and 21, and other passages where the church is coming together, they're partaking of this supper. Uh, and this weekly communion was not a burdensome command. It was meant to be a blessing extended by the grace of God through which spiritual formation and mutual love could be shared. Now, New Testament worship was never meant to be a rote activity. It was meant to be a means to a deeper spiritual awareness and a communion with the transcendent God of the universe. Now, I say that because, listen, you can come here Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, and you can partake of the Lord's Supper, and it just, you get used to it, don't you? And if we're not careful, this can simply become just a rote activity that we're doing for the sake of doing it. And we're not realizing the implications that lie underneath what we're doing here. And so tonight, I just want to briefly talk about what we often refer to as the Lord's Supper. Because Paul warns the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 11, later on in that chapter, in verses 27 through 29, that just doing this, but doing it with the wrong heart or the wrong motives or, or the wrong spirit has serious implications. And so, I want us to focus in on what exactly is the Lord's Supper, what exactly is its purpose, what it is for us, and really see, the, to, a, to a lesser extent, a defense of a weekly practice of the Lord's Supper. Because, as we'll actually talk about later, later on in our class on Sunday morning, Churches in the Shape of Scripture, we'll talk about this weekly observance or practice of the Lord's Supper. But we'll, we'll focus in this evening on what it is and how it, its identity helps us to defend that practice. Um, as we do so, the first thing we want to notice is that the Lord's Supper is a redemptive memorial. It's a redemptive memorial. Okay. Notice, if you turn to Matthew chapter 26, if you're not already there, but notice that the center of the Supper's purpose is to remind His redeemed followers of the location and the means of their salvation. His body, His blood. Notice verse 26. Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to His disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And He took cup and when He had given thanks, He gave it to them saying, Drink it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again for this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Okay? The command, as you know, most tables will say, is to do this in remembrance of me. Do this in remembrance of me. This is my body, he says. Now, we recognize that in, in, con in contrast to our, our Catholic friends who believe in transubstantiation, that is that the, the, the means that the, the bread actually turns into the body of Christ as you're consuming it. We don't believe that this is actually the body of Christ. But, but it is interesting that Jesus doesn't say, this is like my body. He doesn't say that. He said, this is my body. And so the, the point that he's trying to say is, this is so closely related to my body in its significance that you need to see it as coexisting with that. It is a memorial for you to remember my body. So, but the admonition, this is what's interesting, the admonition, do in remembrance of me, is not simply to do this in remembrance of a practice or an act. It is to do it in remembrance of a person. Right? Right? Do in remembrance of me. As you are doing this, remember me. A person whose sacrificial atonement, atonement was the culminating act of God's salvation purposes. It is the ultimate expression of divine grace to a fallen world. I find it interesting that Jesus wants His people... Again, we're trying to look at this from a new lens. I'm trying to get you to see this from a new lens... And I find it interesting that Jesus wants His people to remember His death. Now, that's odd to a certain extent because 
although Calvary was God's greatest expression of love, it was also at the same time our greatest expression of hate and rebellion against God. So he's calling us to remember an act that, yes, shows us his love, but also reminds us of our hate and reminds us of our rebellion. At the scene of Calvary, we witness humanity at its worst. There is betrayal, there's envy, there's hatred, there's greed, there's murder. All of it's witness in the scandalous story. And in stark contrast, we have God's grace and man's grotesque sin. It's almost unbearable. And we're called to remember this heinous scene, to take part in this redemptive story that we see at Calvary. He says, I want you to remember, yes, the greatness of God's grace, but the, 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 the audacity of man's sin. And how in our greatest act of rebellion, God extended the depths of His grace. And because of this, He says, do this in remembrance of me, remembrance of, of my death and, and what happened here. In this act of remembrance, our minds are constantly drawn to our means of salvation. And that is the grace and the mercy and the love of our God. And I want you to see it from this standpoint because as Christians, we are called on a weekly basis to assemble and to remember the grace that worked in our past to save us and the grace that continues to work in our present to sanctify us. As we partake of the Lord's Supper, we are called to remember, I am not worthy. I am not worthy. God has saved me in the past by His grace and He continues to sanctify me this week by His grace. And so the center of Christian worship is a table of grace that influences the entirety of our lives. At the Lord's Supper, at communion, we are both humbled and exalted, both sorrowful and rejoicing. In fact, this contrast of sorrow and joy is actually represented in the symbols that we partake of. And we don't have time to go into this, but the unleavened bread... In Old Testament worship and in Old Testament times generally was used for sorrow or was meant to represent um, depravity, uh, not depravity, but, uh, but lack of means. That is, it was meant to represent at times poverty and uh, even repentance. Okay, so you have the bread of sorrow, but then in contrast to that you have the cup of rejoicing. So you have both of these things represented in the symbol, the sorrow of death and the cross, but the cup of grace and joy that is witnessed with it, with, at Calvary. So you have both sorrow and joy at Calvary experienced within the Lord's Supper. But coupled with this concept of memorialized grace is the fact that the Lord's Supper is just that. It is a supper. And that's what we want to look at next. That the Lord's Supper is a spiritual feast. I don't know, I just think it's extremely interesting. And I'm going to use that word a lot because the study of the Lord's Supper is an extremely interesting study to me. Um, I, I continue to read things about it and it just fascinates me. Um, which, by the way, and here, here is another point that I didn't mention. This, this represents the incarnation of Jesus Christ. This is a memorial to the fact that He came. So the partaking of this body and blood is a testament and a witness to the fact that we believe that Christ came in the flesh, in the person of Jesus Christ. It connects us to the incarnation of God Himself. But it is interesting to me that God places a meal at the center of Christian worship. Now, we generally don't think of this as a meal, do we? I mean, listen, if, if your meal is that paltry, then uh, you're not eating a lot, right? We don't generally think of this as a meal. But in the days of the early church, it was more like a meal. Than we, than we often celebrate it today. And that's why you have issues that the Corinthians had where they began to turn it into more of a, you know, a kind of a hedonistic feast. Well, you know, we don't even think about that because you can't turn this into something other than what it is. But it was more of a feast during, during that time. Uh, of course, that's what the Passover was. And all the Passover was, uh, the Lord's Supper was, was the Passover sanctified for the purposes of Christianity. Christianity. 
as we see in Matthew chapter 26. But in this meal, we are called to eat and drink as we would in any other meal, to eat something, to drink something, and yet there is something different about this, this partaking. This supper is, is both completely earthly and yet altogether otherworldly. It connects us, it's physical, so it's in this world. It's material, so it's in this world, but at the same time, there's something transcendent about it. There is something greater here than just a simple eating. In this meal, we are called to commune with children of God and God Himself. Notice verse 29 in Matthew 26. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Now there's a lot of interpretations concerning that, but I tend to believe that what Jesus is saying is that Jesus is in the presence of His church as we partake of the Lord's Supper and remember His sacrificial atonement. And that's what the song that Damon led earlier this morning, um, the name just went out of my mind, for the, in preparation for the Lord's Supper that we sing all the time, you know which song I'm talking about. But he says uh, that, that the, the one we love the most is now our gracious host. What's he talking about there? He's talking about how really, even though these men are serving the Lord's Supper, the implication is, is that Jesus is the one that is serving the Supper to us. He's the one that is the center of the bounty of God's grace and mercy and love, which is extended to us within the Lord's Supper. So here, within this though, we see a bridge between the spiritual and physical realms. Here we see a tradition passed down to successive Christian generations that calls us to remembrance and transcendence. We are here and we are partaking of something that's physical, but there is something else going on. There is something else we are called to. It's a physical reminder that although Christianity is about great spiritual truths, great spiritual truths, but that it happened in a physical world, that this is connected to a physical, historical act. The Lord's Supper is a physical reminder of the material realities of the ministry of Jesus. As I partake of the Lord, Lord's Supper, I, I don't know, I've been thinking about this a lot more recently. I'm physically eating something. And this is a practice that's been practiced for 2,000 years in Christianity. And so I am called to kind of come, you know, on one hand I'm up on these spiritual heights thinking about these great things that God's done for me. At the same time I'm brought back down to earth because I'm reminded that, that Jesus was just as real as what I'm eating and what I'm drinking right now. Okay, it calls us back to reality that what we're doing here on Sunday and what, how we're living our lives. That it take, although it has to do with great spiritual truths, it takes part in the real world. And so we're reminded that if we want to reign with Christ, then we must consume Christ. We must consume Christ. Now, in John 6, 53 through 56, Jesus says, if you want to be part of me, you have to consume me, right? You have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. Now, I don't think that Jesus was specifically talking about the Lord's Supper in that section of Scripture. What He is talking about is, if you want to have part with me, you must consume me. You must have all of me, right? He's simply talking about Him. You must accept Him for who He is and all of His fullness and all of His glory. But the Lord's Supper represents that. That as I am consuming Christ, it is reminding me that if I want to be with Him for eternity, I can't simply just be part and partial, just, just half-heartedly do this thing called Christianity. I've got to consume Jesus. I have to make Him my all and all. And interestingly enough, Paul connects an abuse of the Lord's Supper to spiritual illness as if you've got a bad bit of food. And yet he says in 1 Corinthians 11, 27-30 that there is a spiritual illness when the Lord's Supper is not appropriately recognized and practiced. So, in the Lord's Supper, in this spiritual feast, I am immediately forced to recognize my utter dependency on Jesus Christ. That, that He is my food. That He is the one that sustains me. That He is the one that upholds me. And hopefully we can 
recognize this. And again, I think that that tends toward and lends toward a defense of a weekly observance of this Christian practice. Weekly, I am called into collective Christian fellowship to declare our shared need for Jesus. Every week, I am calling myself to remind myself, I need this. I need Jesus. I need this grace. I need this mercy. I need this atonement. I constantly need the work of Calvary in my life. So it is a spiritual feast. Thirdly, it is a declaration of future victory. A declaration of future victory. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 26 in reference to the Lord's Supper, As often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till He comes. Notice that last part. Till He comes. There is a great temptation right now for me to go 20 extra minutes talking about this, but I can't because we have the thing afterwards and then Denny would give me a hard time. So, <clears throat> but, but, there is something to be said about this. Worship. Why do we, why do we come together and worship? Why do we worship? The Hebrews writer says we come to stir, and to stir each other up into love and good works. Yes, but for what? Why? Why? Because Jesus is coming again. And all of worship is done under the banner of and in hope of the return of Christ. That is why God's people come together. It's because we need to weekly remind each other, listen, He is coming again. And we're trying to rejuvenate each other and stir up each other to love and good works, to keep living for Jesus. He's going to come back. And that is represented to its fullest extent in the Lord's Supper. You are partaking of the fact, and as you are partaking, you are recognizing that God did come in the flesh and that He is coming again. And so that's why Paul says you are proclaiming Him until He comes. It's not simply a backward glance towards Calvary, but a future gaze in hope of His return. Essentially, we are reminding each other that God has come, that He will come again, that He has made us right in Calvary, but that He will eventually make all things right in the end. And so it's a declaration of what will come. And we are called, again, here I think this solidifies the concept of a weekly observance, observance excuse me, and practice of the Lord's Supper. Because weekly we are called to place our hope in the future work of God. Do you get discouraged during the week? I mean, are there times where you get discouraged? There are times where I get really dis Does that discouragement wait for a couple of weeks before it starts? Or does it start on Monday? Does it start at Monday at 8 o'clock? Discouragement. <laughs> Challenges. Struggles. And we live in a world of despair and heartache. Listen, I guarantee you there is going to be, if you, if you look on your iPhone or if you turn on Fox News in the morning, I'm going to promise you something and it's going to be true. There is going to be some news story that is going to depress you tomorrow. Somebody is going to be killed. Some law is going to pass that is going to be against Christianity. Some terrorist act will maybe be committed. Someone is going to do something that is going to hurt you or discourage you. We live in a world of despair. If that is the case, in a world of constant discouragement and constant despair, who would not want to be a part of a community that constantly fills each other with hope for the future? Because that is exactly what we are trying to do every single week. Keep hope alive. Keep hope alive. For a better tomorrow in Jesus Christ. And so this memorial is the center image of the Christian's centered hope. That God does act, that God has acted, and that God will act again for man's redemption.
and His glory. The message is that there is hope here in this place, at this time, during this event, when we do this. And we can't forget that all of these messages are not simply individual, isolated messages, but a message that we share together as a community of the people of God. And that is our fourth and final point. The Lord's Supper is not only a declaration of future victory, it is a communal celebration. A communal celebration. There's a practice that some church groups have to where when they pass out the Lord's Supper, they wait. Right? If you, if you you've maybe come from a church group that does this, they wait for each other until everyone has uh, some of the unleavened bread and then they all partake of it at the same time. Or they wait till the cup is passed around and then they all partake of it at the same time. Why do they do that? They do it as a reminder that their salvation is not simply singular, isolated, but that it is communal. That they are not simply isolated in their redemption, but they are being redeemed as a community. As a father, our God calls His children to the table to remember with each other as a family, to commune, to enjoy, to encourage, to be a family. And we are taught that although our salvation is individual in the sense of I am saved, it is never isolated. Here we find that our hearts are drawn not only into deeper communion with God, but into deeper communion with each other. As I am partaking of the Lord's Supper and remembering the, the, the salvation that I need, I'm looking, and I've done this at time by the way, so if you ever catch me looking at you during the Lord's Supper, don't be scared. But I look across sometimes the, the congregation as we're partaking of the Lord's Supper, and I'm looking at you because I want to remember that the salvation that I'm experiencing and the salvation that I'm needing is the same salvation that you need. And that the same Jesus that I need is the same Jesus that you need. And that we're in this together. That, that the salvation that we are experiencing together, it is, we're all in this with each other. And, and we're, we're trying to in, encourage each other towards that. And so in this we witness the inseparable link of the continuing work of Jesus Christ as experienced through His people. A people that are united, by the way, a people that are united in the blood and in the body. The blood and the body. That's what unites us. And that's what we're reminded of each and every single week. We are reminded of our shared bond in Christ. As we finish this lesson, I have no clever story or illustration to finish this out. But I, but I want to say this. That I know that in no greater way in Christian worship is God's story witnessed than within communion. Now, we've been talking about in our ACS class, and I like the word story when referring to Scripture. Not in a fictional sense, because the word story does not inherently imply fiction. When we ask, well, what's their story? Are we asking for someone to make up facts about them? What are we asking? What's the overarching narrative of that person's life? And I think that the, the word story can help us to realize that Scripture is not just isolated books, but it is an overarching narrative of how God has revealed Himself to humanity. And that you see that in no greater way than within the Lord's Supper. Because it's here that we see the culminating act of that narrative, of that story. God was here among us, and He still is. Through our weekly observance, we are given a chance to partake of that. And I hope that this in some way encourages you and reminds you of, of the blessing of, of partaking of this meal and this supper. And hopefully it will help you to, to look at uh, at this in a greater dimension than what you previously have seen it because it is it is an amazing practice and I I feel that we need I'm glad that we that we emphasize it more than some other church I'm glad that we have scripture beforehand and I, I want to encourage our men who serve on the Lord's Supper table I know listen I know that there is a tendency for us to kind of there's certain you know there's there's opening prayers and then there's Lord's Supper prayers right and the Lord's Supper prayers have a certain pattern to them I just want to encourage you to try and get out of that mold, to try and pray slightly differently when you lead prayers up here at the Lord's Supper. And I also want to encourage you 
to pray longer so that we have time to focus on what we're actually doing and so that we can remember that. And I, I'm including myself in that because I realize, you know, when I serve on the Lord's table, how, how easy that is. I just want to encourage us, if this is the hub of Christian worship, to make sure we're spending as much time as we possibly can recognizing what is happening here and that our minds are focused and that we're uplifted in grace and in love and in hope of the future return of Jesus. Are you ready for that return? Are you ready for Jesus to come back right now at this moment, at this time? If not, why don't you come as together we stand and as we sing?